everyone, welcome in everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight um, for this exciting conversation on pricing your artwork. We have two artists here tonight that'll be sharing a bit about their journey and experience on this particular topic. We have Elia Ichi Kimaro and Shailene Valenzuela. I know I said that wrong, is it? Shailene, Shailene, I think, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I knew I was gonna trip over my words there. Um, I will be introducing them shortly, but first let me give you a little background um, to help set the stage for how this event came about. My name is Cassandra Town. I'm president of the Robert B. McMillan Foundation. Um, the foundation has been supporting the arts, artists and medical research for the past 18 years. We believe the arts are key to vibrant, thriving communities and we wanna do our part to help ensure artists thrive. So the idea um, for conversations like this one tonight was born out of our efforts to build pillars of support under artists and through the feedback that we've gotten from the Macmillan artist community, which is our group called the Mac. So um, our scholars and our fellows helped inform the topics that we've chosen to speak on this year. Um, two of our nonprofit partners, Gallery One and Allied Arts of Whatcom County, um, share these ideals and um, you know collaboration. It was super easy. It was formed. So tonight um, will be the first of what we hope will be uh, many opportunities um, for conversation by artists for artists. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. So each artist will present for about twenty minutes um, each, and that should leave us about ten-ish or fifteen minutes at the end for Q and A. Um, so this meeting is being recorded. Um, so for Renee, if you wanna go ahead and start that, we can do that. Um, and this will be made available for viewing after the event. And we're still working out the details of that, just how it will come together. But we'll be sure to reach out to all of you here in the room tonight um, so that you have an opportunity to know when it's ready. Um, participants are muted now, and we ask that you remain muted um, until the Q&A portion. Um, and then we'll be encouraging participants um, to kind of to hold their questions until the end. Um, and then more participants can engage in the Q&A in a couple of different ways. So one, you can type them into the chat box and um, the mod one of us moderators can read the question out loud to the group, or we can use the reactions button at the bottom and kind of raise your hand. And that what we'll do is order the group here. So whoever raised their hand first will get to ask their question out loud when called upon. Um, so, okay, I, I think that's everything. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our two guest speakers tonight. We have Elia Ichi Kimaro. Um, she makes art to locate where she stands in the flow of cultural inheritance and legacy. A self-taught artist, Elia Ichi will learn whatever medium it takes to tell her story that is emerging. Tell the story that is emerging. Over the past 40 years, she has used writing, music, photography, film, storytelling, and now visual art to explore her personal and family narrative. Her feature film, A Lot Like You, from 2011, won six Best Documentary Awards on the film festival circuit before being broadcast nationally on PBS. After nine years in the campus conference lecture circuit, Elia Ichi distilled her keynotes in her 2016 TED Talk Seattle. TEDx Seattle talk, there we go. Why the world needs your story. For the past eight years, painting has been her chosen method for exploring the stories she's inherited and the story she's passing down. Shalene Valenzuela was born and raised in Santa Barbara, California. She received a BA in art practice at the University of California at Berkeley and an MFA in ceramics from California College of the Arts and Crafts. In 2007, she moved from her longtime home of Oakland, California to participate in a long long-term residency at the Clay Studio of Missoula. She currently maintains a studio in the historic Brunswick building and serves as the executive director at the Clay Studio of Missoula. Shalene has been a guest artist and speaker at a number of art centers, colleges, and university. Her work has been featured in several group and solo exhibitions nationally and is a number and, and, and in a number of private and public collections. So with that in mind and that out of the way now, let's go ahead and, and um, welcome Elia Ichi to speak first to us. Hey everyone, it's so nice to be here. Let me just first share my screen here. Can you see that? Is that working? Okay, great. So my, like, um, thank you so much, Cassandra, to Gallery One and Allied Arts. It's so nice to be here with you tonight. My name is Elia Ichi Kamaro and I'm 50 and married with a teenage kid, and I work as a full-time artist. I have a home studio where I work every day, and this space um, here is behind our house, and it's where I have folks come by and see my work in person if they're interested. So um, I'm self-taught, 
and I've been painting for eight years. And uh, last year I completed 52 paintings and I sold 41. Um, but my road to art was a little bit complicated. Like, like a lot of folks, I quit making art uh, when I was really young. Uh, for me, it was in the fourth grade because I wasn't any good at it. Um, and I didn't pick it up again until I had a kid. Um, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm talking and I'm totally forgetting to scroll through the thing. This is multitasking, not my forte. Anyhow, so, um, so I picked up art again when I had a kid. Uh, and when I pull out the supplies, uh, we make art together. And, you know, there's just something about creating that clicked for me and watching my kid make um, with no inner critic. It just seemed so liberating and joyful. So I decided to just follow her lead and just sort of brought a deeper level of focus to my practice. And I'm so grateful now that I have this creative outlet in my life, you know, every, especially over the past few years while in quarantine, carving out this time to get into the studio every day, I really feel it, it really saved me. It really did. So um, while I've been only painting for eight years, the value of my work, I believe, is rooted in the 40 years I've spent exploring my personal and family narrative through writing, music, film, photography, storytelling, and now mixed media art. And so before I, before I talk about how I price my work, I, I need to pull the lens back just a little bit and share how I came to my work. And then I promise I will tie it all back to the issue of pricing. Okay, so I'm a mixed race, first generation American. When I was a kid, my parents would regale me with their childhood stories. Uh, mom about growing up in Seoul, South Korea, and dad on Mount Kilimanjaro tan in Tanzania. And I loved hearing them because I knew that their stories were my origin story. I mean, we are all, right? Every one of us, each of us is the embodiment of the life stories of our parents and our grandparents and our ancestors. And we carry their stories forward with us, you know, whether we're conscious of them or not. So making art is how I make sense of these stories. Hmm, I'm missing a slide in here, sorry, here. Making art is how I make sense of these stories that I've inherited and the stories that I'm now passing down. And the act of creating shows me where I stand in this flow between cultural inheritance and legacy. So for me, this process always begins on the page. I started a daily writing practice when I was seven. And for 43 years, this has been the creative cornerstone of my life. Like everything I make starts on the page. And it's less about what I write. Huh, again, something's, I'm not sure what's happened with my slideshow. Some things are out of order. Okay, uh, it's less about what I write and more about this daily practice of dumping the mundane contents of my thinking brain, like my planning brain down on the page and letting it go. And only then am I able to access this well of creativity that exists just below the surface. Um, so with music, I mentioned music. I started playing the violin when I was four. And when I left the conservatory at 18, I put my violin down and I never picked it up again. Um, and even though my formal musical education felt like a creative straitjacket, it was really useful later on when it came to working on projects like my film. When I was 15, I fell in love with photography and I started documenting my life. This practice now serves me well on Instagram, where I document the daily evolution of my paintings uh, and of myself as an artist. But photography is where I really learned how to see. And I started paying attention to my attention and realizing that I actually had a point of view. I was drawn to objects that were rusty, weathered and worn, like old city walls or doors with peeling posters and paint. I really loved layered surfaces that are aged, and look like they've lived many lives. And I didn't see this as an aesthetic sensibility, but looking back on my pictures, I see the seeds of this layered weathered beauty that I'm trying to evoke in my paintings now. My biggest creative turn happened when I turned 30. I had been working for 12 years as a crisis counselor with survivors of rape and abuse, and I was starting to burn out. And also at this time, my partner and I were talking about having kids and I was struggling to figure out how I was supposed to pass down my cultural heritage. And then one day, um, driving to work, uh, it hit me, that film. My parents 
had moved back to my father's home, which is a coffee farm on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. So my, my daughter was not growing up, was, wasn't gonna grow up hearing the same stories that I did as a kid, but my parents were there, dad's siblings were there, and with film, my now daughter could see her parents and her grandparents and her ancestors and hear her origin story directly from the source. So I figured moving picture with sound was the perfect medium for collecting our family stories. And I had no film background, but we had a media arts center in town. And so I signed up for an intro to filmmaking class. And six and seven months later, actually, my partner and I quit our jobs, bought one-way tickets to Tanzania, um, and all our equipment on eBay, and we were off. And over the next eight years, I harnessed every skill in my toolbox to bring my, my film to life. My writing, photography, editing, storytelling, music. And most notably, I had to summon my trauma counseling skills while sitting with my family and bearing witness to the messy, complicated, conflicting truths that often exist within a family. And all the seemingly disparate skills that I'd been cultivating my entire life made me uniquely qualified to tell this story. So my film, A Lot Like You, premiered in 2011. And for the next nine years, up until the world shut down, basically, I was speaking at campuses and conferences around the world uh, about the issues raised in our film and about how speaking your truth has the power to transform and heal, not just the speaker, but the listener as well. And these keynotes culminated with my TEDx Seattle talk, Why the World Needs Your Story. Okay, so now I'm turning 40 and suddenly I felt this pull, the strong pull towards visual art. I didn't question it and I just started painting. And when I got stuck, I just found mentors and teachers who could show me how, because I no longer question the calling when it arrives, right? I might not know why I feel drawn to be doing what I'm doing, I just know that it will all make sense in, the, in hindsight. So I just simply go where the energy is and I build that muscle. So in my work now, I build uh, layered multimedia paintings that look like they've lived many lives and their surfaces are weathered and worn like the surfaces I found so beautiful in my photographs. And I love that after some time, all I see are multiple layers coexisting on the surface and even I couldn't tell you which layer came first. I often embed objects from my life, journal pages, letters, maps, concert tickets into various layers of my painting. So for example, this painting here, this is the base layer. This is the very first layer of my painting that's called Belonging. It's about three foot by five foot. And it's a collage of transcribed interviews with my family on Mount Kilimanjaro many of whom have since passed away. And I wrote, these are the conversations that I recorded with my family uh, 10 years prior for my film. And here's how the piece ended up. And while you can't read any of the passages in the final piece, when you're standing in front of it, you catch glimpses of the worlds underneath, right? And you can sense the story. So, like I said, Writing is my springboard for everything I create. Journal writing is how I mine the depths, making my subconscious conscious. And then creating art is how I make sense of what I've just unearthed. Art for me is no longer, I mean, especially since quarantine, it's no longer an if I have time matter. It has become as integral to my well being as my daily writing practice. It's a must, right? It helps me restare, re repair and restore those parts of my soul that are beyond the reach of just words. So when I head into the studio, I just show up and I paint my truth on that day. And what my painting is about doesn't re reveal itself until later in the process. And sometimes not until long after the piece is done. So I can have a painting that feels completely resolved, but still might, I might not know what it's about. So I'll stare at it, I'll study it, I'll hang it in different parts of the house. And it isn't until I get the name right that everything falls into place and I finally understand what this painting has been trying to say. And that said, it's not important to me at all that other people see my piece the way I do. My titles will sometimes hit at, hint at it, but I love that people bring their own lens to my work. And when they share their stories with me about what they see in my work, it's yet another gift that my painting is giving me. So 
How does this relate to pricing? For me, this distinction between value and price, it matters. Um, to say I'm a self-taught artist who has been painting for eight years is true, but my painting draws upon decades of work exploring my personal and family narratives. And all of this factors into my pricing structure and my rates. So, okay, so how I came to, to my pricing method is I had my first art show after painting for only two years. And I didn't have a clue about how to price my work, but I needed to come up with some dollar amount for the labels. So I priced my work based on how much the work meant to me and, or what it cost me, whether in materials or time or in sweat equity. And the pieces I labored over longer, I valued higher, kind of understandably, but it felt arbitrary, right? And the variability was confusing. And it was hard to justify why two pieces of the same size in the same medium had different prices. So after that show, I did some informal market research and I looked at the price range of artists working at, compar at a comparable level as myself. And I was applying to become a member at Columbia City Gallery at the time, uh, which is an artist co-op in my neighborhood here in Southeast Seattle. And um, their members work gave me sort of like a ballpark figure to, to shoot for. And I also talked with seasoned 2D artists about their pricing strategies. And I saw the appeal of charging per square inch. And I appreciated actually the simplicity and the consistency of this approach. So I figured out a price for a medium 24 by 24 that felt good to me, keeping in mind that this price had to work across all selling conditions, right? Regardless of where the piece, what part of the country the piece is being sold, the gallery commission, like in my experience, is generally ranged between 30% and 50%, or whether I was selling directly from my studio or website or um, Instagram, that price had to be the same. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And um, I know that people have different opinions about whether prices should be list listed on the websites, but for me, because I sell my art directly from my website, listing prices is a must, right? I want it to be as easy as possible for people who want my work to be able to buy my work. So consistency and transparency for me is really key. Okay, so once I had a price in mind for a medium-sized piece, I divided it by the square inches to determine my base rate per square inch. And then I figured out a slightly higher rate for smaller pieces and a slightly lower rate for larger pieces. So that way it smooths out the bell curve when you consider the full range of my prices, the prices of my work. And, um, and there were some tweaks that I had to make along the way. If <clears throat> the amount came out to be sort of a funky in-between number, I rounded it to the nearest multiple of 25. So if the, the price was 218 or $232, I would just round it to 225. Um, and I frame my smaller works on paper and those can get up to, um, those are up to the size of 16 by 20. And so I figured out one standard framing rate that works across the board. Um, so I just charge the same. If I'm matting and framing a piece up to 16 by 20, I, it's the same surcharge. And I generally make more smaller works than bigger ones. So it kind of evens out over time. And if people ask me for discounts, um, I just let them know that, you know, they're getting a really good deal because my work will never be cheaper than it is today. Um, and that generally will work. So um, that said, I occasionally discount my rates um, for certain folks who are for a fixed period of time, usually frontline activists who are working across various causes, but it's at my discretion and I rarely publicize that. So. Since setting my pricing structure in 2016, I've raised my rates once in 2019 um, because I was selling out of most of my work. And so I adjusted my prices slightly to match the growing demand. And, um, and my rates now, I feel, they feel commensurate with my experience, both as an emerging artist and as a multidisciplinary storyteller who's been doing this work for some time. Okay, and? That's all I had to share. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you all in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna uh, post um, 
Elia Achi's information here in the chat. So if you guys wanna learn more about her work um, following the presentation, you're welcome to go check that out. So thank you. And we'll move over to Shalene. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, oops. I just got muted. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I think that was my error. That I was my I, error. Sorry. Start I over. unmuted myself and then you get it. So, <laughs> yeah, that was me. Okay. So I'll start, start over. <laughs> so, my name is Shalene Balanzuela. Um, I live in Missoula, Montana. I am a 3D artist, mainly focusing um, with ceramic work. And um, I'm going to share a little slideshow that talks a little about me and I'm um, like sort of very brief um, about the roles I play. So, um, let's see. It would help if I shared my screen first. So, great. So can you all see the slide lecture? First slide. So um, what I do have, um, so I am the executive director of the Clay Studio of Missoula. It's a um, nonprofit ceramic arts focused uh, facility. Um, we offer uh, various classes and workshops for all ages and levels um, focusing in clay. Uh, we also have a vibrant community um, of studio artists that come and rent space and um, work together in the community and um, various uh, kilns that people fire in and whatnot. So we're like outside of the university, the primary resource for our community and ceramic arts. And we also have a artist residency program. And so I'm talking a little bit about, the, about all this stuff because um, you know, kind of my knowledge and about pricing and whatnot is also my experience and working with a community arts center and working with artists and residents and community artists and figuring out pricing work. And um, so our residency artist program um, brings in artists from um, mainly around the US. Um, we've had some international visitors before, but um, they come and immerse ourselves in their, immerse themselves in our community and um, they're our primary instructors for our adult education program. And, um, and they stay up to two years at a time in the program. And then we also have a exhibition and sales gallery there so that we are featuring, focused on ceramic arts and sort of the re Western, Northwestern region of the US. Um, and this is our current, I shot a few of these photos today. <laughs> so this is our, um, community artist show. So these are a lot of members that um, work in our space. And then we also have a sales gallery that um, people, current and past artists and residents still work in and also um, community members and regional artists and um, feature their work in there. I've been um, the executive director at the Clay Studio in Missoula since um, 2012 and I realized that's almost 10 years which is shocking to me and um, another thing is that when I came I actually came to the clay studio in Missoula in 2007 to be an artist in residence and I would my long-term goal wasn't necessarily to be the director of a nonprofit arts organization in Missoula when I went there but that's just kind of it was it's a really wonderful community and um, I sort of carved out a good space there and so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the process of making my work um, because that's sort of integral and in how um, my pricing process um, comes into play because there's a lot of stages um, in creating my work that might not be obvious from the get-go. So um, basically I work, um, most of my work is done by slip casting which I'll walk you a little bit through that process. So I make uh, plaster molds um, out of actually found, actual found objects in order to create the forms that I create my imagery on. And so it takes a lot of time. Like sometimes it takes me a lot of time finding these forms. Um, sometimes they come to me, um, but I make these. Um, so all my molds that I create myself in order to create these pieces. And so I kind of work in series because of that. Um, 
it, mold making lends itself to multiples and series of objects. And so, um, and it's sort of in line with um, how I create, well, you know, it's kind of the conceptual focus of my work is like, I'm creating kind of making commentary on mass consumption and um, homemaking and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of um, ties into that. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the slip casting process because a lot of people are like, well, how do you create um, these objects out of these plaster molds? So what slip casting is, is um, it's this ceramic slip is actually a kind of a liquefied clay body. And then what you do is you pour it into these uh, plaster molds. And um, what happens is uh, the mold takes a little bit of time to set up probably um, with a smaller object, 10 to 15 minutes. And um, it's basically the same concept as those uh, hollow um, chocolate Easter bunnies, like you break open and it's sort of a shell. Um, it's sort of like the slip cast object is sort of the same thing. And so once the slip starts setting up in the mold, you pour the remainder of the, um, the slip that hasn't set up out of that mold and the stuff inside forms a shell and starts hardening. And so you wait, like um, some of these objects probably wait uh, 45 minutes to an hour to pop out of these molds. And then you take the mold apart and voila, there's your little uh, slip cast object right there. And so um, it's a great way to like sort of produce these multiples. And so that's kind of an example of the, the piece popped out of the mold. And so pretty much all the forms I make are um, made out, you know, they're made out of these molds and um, I piece things together. And some, some of these pieces, um, for, you know, have a bit of complexity to the, how they're constructed. So for example, I have these phone pieces there um, here and I'll show you like just kind of like intimate groupings of items. So you can see like the relationships and how I work in series and themes. And so, um, with this phone mold, um, so for example, these phones, they're actually three different molds that I create um, the piece out of. And then um, the object is reconstructed. The one on the right is a newer wall phone. So it's actually, I've used, um, I made a mold of a wall-based uh, head like base and then um, have been, was able to use the mold of the headset and cord and the phone cord, yes, it's clay as well in case that was a question. <laughs> and then all the imagery that I use is like, um, I create these narratives on the pieces that um, reference fairy tales, urban mythologies, consumer culture, societal expectations, etiquette, politics, and environmental issues. There's a lot of different things plugged in there. And um, you kind of like, there are all these objects that you kind of have a relationship with in the home or, um, like they, there's a lot of older objects that may bring up nostalgia. And um, so that's sort of the pretty images on there and like sort of these uh, cookie cutter models that you often see out of these 50s and 60s advertisements, like sort of, they, they sort of employ themselves like you would see an advert advertisement, like where you see it from afar, it draws you in and then you start investigating it and see what like, you start seeing different like things in the narrative that might make you draw back and realize that what beneath the shiny veneer of these relics hides a complex and sometimes contradicting truth of what things seem to appear as upon first glance. So um, here's some irons that I've created too. Those are, um, I've created series of these. And so um, some of these like create, um, like you have these notions and like I like sort of these like some things are a little more subtle than others. <laughs> and then um, a series of toasters and then the toast themselves, is, the toast itself is actually clay. And so, um, you know, an example too, where I'm taking the object of the toaster, but the toast itself and the like state of it being burnt um, in the 3D form is actually another, creates another um, layer of the narrative to that piece. And so, um, you know, the details are everything. 
And then some, so, and these are um, some, um, what I call, I also work with a lot of puns and titles. Um, so for example, these are called um, implements of self-construction or, and on the one on the left is implements of self-destruction. And so um, the idea of a hammer, um, you know, being this tool that's used for constructing or destructing things. And then um, the pegboards are actually made out of clay as well. And then the one on the left, I was sort of, my idea of invasive species and, um, you know, invasive plants. And then um, the humans as like kind of ourselves being invasive species on this planet in some sense of um, just sort of like what we, you know, do upon the planet that um, is self-destructive to it or destructive to it. Um, and then um, the one on the right has to do more with them. Um, that one was actually a little more inspired about all the detritus in my life, like sort of, I actually just bought a house this past year and <laughs> as an artist who um, collects a lot of things um, in order to, <laughs> um, I have my library of stuff to reference and I like to be surrounded by objects. Um, this like piece on the right, that was a little more inspired by that. Um, but um, so this is an example of two items, two pieces of work that, um, you know, one, the one on the left is a little more complex with um, in scale and in elements and the one on the right is a little, you know, just a singular piece. So, um, you know, even though I work in a lot of series that I'm like doing series of items, there's um, sometimes there's scale shifts based on the canvas I'm creating. And then so sometimes these forms grow a little more complex. Um, and as I referenced with um, sort of the toaster pieces as um, some of the sculptural um, elements in the piece, um, like, so, like help build the narrative of the 2D form. This is uh, called cinched in, in the garden. And then um, so these pictures of, um, you know, the imagery on it um, has these like cookie cutter women of all, like the, I basically also in this, um, they all have the, like there's this like flesh tone that I use for all these women called light flesh. And it's just a little unnerving because it's like, it's a, those fifties and sixties models where everybody's like sort of this cookie cutter thing. And so it's a little bit unsettling to, see these women that are all um, like paint, these ideal painted images of themselves. And I like that push and pull that questioning of, are these people, are these supposed to be idealized forms or are these people trying to bust out of this? And it's sort of this like um, with my um, imagery that I use, um, one of the thing, questions that comes up that it's like, why are you using this fifties and sixties imagery? And it's like, that idea of like human, us as humans, it's like three steps forward, two steps back sort of things. And if I, you know, if this, if the, the subject matter wasn't so, I mean, it, it's a lot of these ideals of perfection are still ring very true today. And so, um, you know, I'm exploring a lot of that and also a lot of myself and some of the history of my family. Um, my father is from Mexican American background and, um, you know, when he was growing up, his father basically was like, we're in America now, um, you know, it didn't teach my father Spanish or anything. And then um, sort of like, you know, a lot of things were whitewashed in my family in that sense. So there's a little bit of that history in that as well. And um, this is, um, I'm, so I'm showing these like larger forms. So, um, a lot of these more complex forms as well, because um, some of this will um, reference back to my ideas of pricing. Because um, that's what we're supposed to be talking about. And I started talking to a lot more about like the inspiration of my work and um, all, all the things that I think about. Um, so this is uh, called uh, Easy Back, um, Suck It Up, Ear or it's called Suck It Up, Ears Are Burning. And then, so it's the idea of, um, you know, a vacuum cleaner is this tool that's supposed to suck up dirt. 
And then you have these like gossipy women in the circle around this piece. So it's like this object itself is sucking up dirt and holding dirt in. And so this is like the imagery relates to that as well. So um, again, a lot of these questions, is that made out of clay? Yes, pretty much every element um, of this piece is ceramic, um, except for the two little screws um, holding together the vacuum brush and the hose. So um, I'm not that insane to make <laughs> my attachments and connections out of clay. And a part of working in the um, vein of trompe l'oeil is just like, again, but like not everything is as it, like it looks like a real object, but then when you get up like the actual object, but when you get up to it, you're like, oh, there's like something a little off about this. And, um, you know, in my work, I like that, like, you know, that like deception of bringing someone in and like sort of discovering new things about the work when they get closer and observe what's actually going on. And so to demystify that a little bit, when I was talking about my molds, this is actually the primary like base of that piece. This is like that piece itself took seven molds to make. Um, these are two to like the, um, the mold, the bigger part with the compact vacuum, like the main part of the body of the mold is um, the piece is the um, part up here. And then um, the, um, the like top, the little lid on that piece is right here. So that's what that mold looks like. Um, and then I make some smaller objects where um, they're little more, um, little more of snapshots, like, kind of one-off things where it's like more of a capturing like simpler elements or like simpler narratives. And then of course, being in clay, I'm um, asked to make functional things a lot. Um, so I make these small little intimate objects that are, I consider a little bit um, more reproducible um, that I can make, ma make more masses of um, and it gives more access to like those smaller intimate things. Um, and so it's actual, um, an apple sugar pot and then a teapot. Um, it's actually to scale the pin cushion and thread and, um, somewhat functional, I guess. <laughs> a lot of my work I like to refer to as dysfunctional. And so <laughs> again, me working with puns. And then um, more functional items. And these are start, you know, straight up functional. And these are more, um, and a lot of my works, as you see, I work in series, but you see that a lot of the imagery that it's very intensely hand painted with under glaze and glaze and that um, they're more um, one of a kind pieces. And then these like little functional like sets of things I do, they'll be, even though there are a lot of, um, there's like slight variations, I don't see these more as like one of a kind works. So. Um, some tinier pieces that kind of like a little more accessible to anyone. And so um, that's a little bit of example on my work. So I'll stop sharing right now. There we go. And so what does all these ramblings have to do with um, how to price work, right? Um, and how do I approach this? Um, because I don't necessarily, because of, I want to talk about um, a little bit about my work being, it, it, since it's made from molds, the molds themselves, as you can tell, um, are intense in making them. Um, a lot of people are like, well, how long does it take you to make a mold? Like the mold of that vacuum that I showed, um, I was at a residency and it took me pretty much the entire, I was working on other things, but it took me pretty much the entire month of that residency to make that mold. So um, some objects, um, even though you don't see it in the piece itself, like the mold itself is this like kind of dirty part of it, but um, it does take a while to do that and make the, they make that tool in order to create right, right work. So that's a little bit of part of that that I have to consider. And so, um, you know, when I was new coming to this, it was like, it was like, well, where it was like one of those things where it's like, well, how do I price my work? It's just so hard because you're, 
putting value on something that means so much to you and it's like well in a way like sure like a million dollars I guess I don't know but like let's be realistic it's like so it's like so basically it's like I looked at, again at artists with making comparable type work with who was who were kind of at that same entry point as I was when I first started trying to price work um and then, so there's various factors I use in pricing my work. And unfortunately, because of the complexity in making um, plaster molds and also 3D forms and um, the fact that some of my pieces, um, I could slip cast a piece and it's like one form. Some of them involve a little bit more nuances with sculpting and reattaching things and stuff like that. So there's various elements that are in play. So one thing that I'll consider is the complexity of the form I'm making like how long does it make me take me to not only make the mold and how many am I going to make but are how do I how how much do I have to do in constructing that piece um the scale has a little bit to do with that too um and also for me those larger works are a little hard to harder to make as well and so scale plays into it as well and also the complexity of the imagery that I'm creating on the form. Um, though when I'm like, let's say making a toaster or making an iron, um, you know, they're pretty much like you'd say like the 24 by 24 painting where it's like one toaster, even though I might spend a little more time creating the imagery on one toaster, like I'm going to charge the same price as I do for the other one because I want to remain consistent with that pricing. So people kind of like look at it and it's not, doesn't feel arbitrary because what might be my favorite is not somebody else's favorite. <laughs> so, um, and so a lot of that is like really remaining consistent with your pricing. Um, another thing that I like to mention because this relates to me as an artist and also a lot of things that I see as a person who, um, is the executive director of a nonprofit where we do have a gallery space is um, being consistent with your pricing across the board, whether you show, have it in a gallery that takes 50%, have it in a gallery that takes 30% or are selling it out of your studio or selling it on your website. Um, Cause I'm represented by several galleries and it would be not like not behoove me if I were to be like, oh, go to my website and you can get my piece for half the price. <laughs> You can at my gallery down the street. And so um, a common mistake I see some artists making is, um, I mean, I, I will, we have different shows, um, like we'll get calls for entries for juried shows, and then an artist will submit some price. And then when their piece gets in the show, they change the price of the piece. <laughs> so I'm just like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> And or some or I've had discussions with some artists that will be like, well, this place is taking this percentage, so I need to up my price to this in order to do that. So I try to tell people like you're not doing like set your prices to the price you'd want to get um, for that commission. And if you sell it out of your studio or sell it as a place taking 30 percent, great, you're getting a little bit more for that. But um you know, you want to keep your galleries happy too, because they're working for you as well. So it's always um, good to be consistent in that pricing. And so fortunately, like I knew that a little early, so I didn't learn that lesson the hard way at all. But um, it's something that I like to really reinforce with people. Um, and then so I had covered how I, you know, keep if I, there's an object in the series that's the same, like um, I keep them the same, pretty much the same price. If I do a sculptural element that might make it a little different or make it more complex, I might bump up the price with that. So that might be um, a similar thing. And then when I make new forms, what's the hardest is when you make something brand new you've never made before, right? And then you're like, wow, how do I price this piece? Like it's a scale, it's a, like an, incorporating like an element that I've never really had before in my work. And so my frame of reference for that is trying to most find the most similar object in my repertoire that I have a point of reference to what I've already priced in order to create that. Um, and of course, because I create 
price I, since I create works that are kind of more of that like smallish to medium scale um, sculptural work the things that I find more challenging is when I make something really large that I spend a lot of time on so that and you know if you do work at the gallery it's always good to be like hey can you give me some advice or do you think this sounds too low too high and so I'm not shy about asking you know the people I trust to, that the people who have sold my work before for a little advice if like like hey I'm thinking this um so it's good to discuss those things and talk it out and then um I'm all for gradually bumping up pricing because it's like you know there's inflation <laughs> it's like an artist should get paid for the work they do and um you know so basically if like I'm selling a piece and it, it seemed like a little less expensive somewhere else um it's because it's been maybe in that gallery for a couple of years or something like that and that um and then so i'm not going to i don't bump up pieces like if i price to work i like you know piece from 2018 i'll keep it at that 2018 price but um any newer form after that i'll like keep at the newer pricing and so and then so that i have a record and like consistency with that and i mean for me like as far as bookkeeping goes i um you know i keep inventory like when i send off inventory for group shows when i'm in a guest you know i'm in a, invited to a show where i have a piece somewhere i keep inventory forms of anything so if i do need to reference back to when there were changes in pricings and stuff like that i can do that accordingly um and then so you know, it's like being consistent and just being honest with um, the way you price your work is kind of like the best rule of thumb. And like, and, you know, a lot of these things have been mentioned before. It's, um, you know, when people are like, oh, so I remember one time, I think I came back and I sold some little functional work at some table or something. And I mean, when I just got back to Missoula, after teaching Portland for a year and I'd made of small pieces and I was selling them at a table and then somebody came up to me and said, can you give me $5 off? Like if I buy two, because your work will be seen in Portland. And I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> like, first of all, I just moved back from there. <laughs> Second of all, I was just like, okay, so it, this didn't take me like less time because I made two of them. It's like, so it's like always valuing you're in, you know, standing strong and not caving to that because it, you, you're setting your prices for a reason and you did take time for that. Um, and then I don't really, um, another thing that I was thinking about when we were talking about pricing work or how to price work. Um, one thing is that, um, and I don't know, and maybe in the later conversation, people have questions like I don't work on commissions so much. Um, basically, if I'm commissioned to do something, it's like, oh, can you make another piece in this repertoire? And maybe it has some like a different color in it or something like that. And since all of mine are one of a kind, like like all the images and narratives change and flow in different ways, and I don't make the same of with the well, with the cups and the flasks and stuff like that, I'll make copies of those. But um, with the work I see as my primary work, I don't make, if somebody's like, oh, I want the exact piece that other person has, I won't make that. Um, but I'm not gonna, I generally don't have people do commission. You Like basically as an artist, you have to decide whether you're gonna, like what level of commissioning you're gonna do. And so I basically, I won't give somebody a cheaper price just because they're commissioning thing, or if they ask for too many exceptions. Um, but um, then I'm like, well, I, I just back out of that. Or if you want me to do a little extra, then I'll charge a little bit more. So, but that's pretty much it. Um, I'm sure there are some other questions that will come up, but thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Shalene. I appreciate it. And Elliot. Ichi, um, both great presentations, great artwork. Um, I want to open up the floor. Um, if people have questions, you're free to post them in the chat. And one of us moderators, Renee from Gallery One or myself, can read them out loud. Or if you want to raise your hand and uh, mute yourself, you're free to go ahead and um, ask your questions. 
I did have a question, um, probably for both, both, both of you could answer. Um, do you raise your prices when, like if you've won a major award or if your work was published in a book or magazine, um, is that some, like, do you see that as like adding credibility to your work so you should therefore charge more? <laughs> I'm like, um, I don't, I mean, I think all, I think all my stuff has been pretty gradual. So it's like, a. I think it's all fit into like the sort of uh, like then my gradual inflation, like bumping up things. And it's like, I've never done any major changes like, oh, I got this award. So I'm going to double the price of something. But, um, but th that does kind of build into that sort of like your time that you spent like, okay, I've been working in this medium or I've been working towards this concept for this long. So that's part, that's part of your building blocks to create that value, that experience. I don't know. I guess I just haven't had anything major like that happen where it's like, oh, I have to do this thing now where I have to absolutely change the price of my work. I don't know. Um, really. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to... I mean, I, I think I'm the same. Um, I, I'm, I'm in a similar boat. I think uh, for me, the the increase has been incremental um, and not sort of based on sort of, you know, there's there's a lot of um, attention that can can rise and fall and come and go. And um, but I just feel like the the value of my work is just sort of like a steadier. It's on its own sort of iceberg <laughs> pace you know what I mean I'm just sort of steadily increasing over time and I mean it might factor into the next time I I, I don't even think it would affect the amount that I would raise it by um, at my next price increase I, I just think that's it's it's nice to get and and I think I just steady on awesome thank you um we had a question posted in the chat so Good or specialized size frames can cost a lot. How do you figure in prices for framed art versus unframed canvases? Ooh, that sounds like it might be a question for me. Yeah. Um, you? Okay. So, <laughs> <a> question for <laughs> me. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Honestly, um, it's not an area of expertise for me because most of my paintings, because of the way I paint and what I paint, um, and my style, my very aggressive style. Um, I don't really paint that much on canvas or paper. And so for me, my paper paintings are more of like a warm up. Uh, uh, they're sort of like, they're like my, my, my writing, my daily writing in my journal, but then I show up in the studio and I have my paper out and I just sort of loosen up on the paper and I get some ideas going and then I move on to doing my painting. And sometimes those pieces turn out nice enough to sort of trim down and frame. So. Um, that's a really good question, except I'm only ever using very standard sizes of, um, you know, I don't know, like 11 by 14 or 12 by 16. Um, I think when you do move into more specialty sizes, uh, that would be its own consideration. I, I, I don't really feel like I can speak to that. Maybe there's someone in the, in the group who might be able to, I don't know. I, I might comment on that just from my experience, knowing some gallery owners um, in general. Um, a lot of people like to reframe works because they want all their frames in their house to be a certain color. They all want them all white or black or, you know, whatever. Um, and so generally, um, I would say don't spend a lot of money on a frame. Um, just have consistency with your framing, kind of like you have consistency with pricing um, mm -hmm. and assume that they might get reframed by the purchaser anyway. Nice. Anyone else have anything? I've got a couple of other questions here we could ask real briefly towards the end here, unless someone has. I just have a question. I don't know how to do the raise yeah. my hand. Go ahead, Susan. It's okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just curious I whether there, what you all think about the idea of pricing something differently, if it's going to be on public display, because I, a city bought and artwork of mine and it they paid more than when I sell it to other people and partly that just happened because it was their minimum and it was a lot different like five hundred dollars versus five dollars but then a volunteer lawyer with Washington lawyers for the arts was saying that the 
kind of the rights are very different when it's in the public domain for public display. So just from a lawyer's perspective, he thought that was justified. But I, I'm just wondering about that question. Well, is it more so that they got an honorarium to show this piece? I mean, or they, or they just, it was an award or a purchase for that, or is that yeah. like, is that people, it's like, I mean, it's one thing, it's like when you're pre keeping your prices consistent, but if like, let's say you're like, oh, I'm charging the city this, but <laughs> I'm gonna charge, or one client this or one client that, but if it's more so of like a purchase award or something like that, was that, is that the case more so or? Yeah, like the city of Seattle was was asking people to submit uh, applications so because mm -hmm. the city wanted to buy art for their rotating collection. So it was like a, their public art collection that they were expanding mm -hmm. and then they frame it themselves and they they asked for more information like about how to frame it or any considerations for conservation and that sort of thing. So it was like a public, it was like a public application, public art application. And the, it, the city of Bellevue is doing the same thing this week. They're asking for applications by Friday. So they didn't give an award to make something, but they were purchasing things. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that was the situation. Yeah, I don't know. Any, <laughs> that, that... That one's a little different one because it's not like so much you're selling work with a gallery or anything like that, like, or selling to one client, one thing, one, even though the city's being client, they're obviously doing these purchases for public art. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I see it more like it's a grant type sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I think I would agree. It seems like, um, like they have set aside funding for the mm -hmm. sole purpose of purchasing this art for, for public consumption. So I, I think it was more uh, like internally for them, even if they're paying you more than you would generally charge for it. I mean, I think that that's, I don't think that that would affect my pricing moving forward. You know what I mean? I think that's just like a one, one off thing. It's, yeah, it's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I remember, um, uh, I, don I donated a piece to the Artist Trust auction um, when I'd been painting for about four years and it went for a very surprising amount of money that I had never made on a painting before. Yeah. And I had, I had a moment of thinking, I'm like, ooh, ooh, I should triple my prices. No, you know, so I think it's a, it might be, I don't know if it's in that similar vein, but I, I something about that feels familiar, yeah. Yeah, no, I've had that same thing too, where you're like, oh, wait, why can't, <laughs> why doesn't anyone buy, they're like, look, I got your piece for this much, I'm like, too bad you didn't pay me that. <laughs> right, right. So. Well, thank you all. We have reached the seven o'clock hour. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone, um, Renee Adams from Gallery One, Shalene Vallen, um, and Ilya Hachi for um, presenting tonight. Um, it was an excellent conversation. Um, to learn more about the foundation, I've put the link in the chat for um, the upcoming events. We've got two more scheduled, um, a mask making event at the end of March and another event with um, another artist speaking uh, in April. So um, check back often. And um, again, thank you to our two artists tonight for helping. Um, I appreciate you all being here. So have a good night and we will reach out when um, the video is available um, for you all to circle back and watch it again. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank